So does anybody have any questions to start us off with? Yes? Um, you mentioned the qualities of enlightenment, and I wrote down, I didn't get the first two. Oh, um, the characteristics of the, uh, well, I'm not sure, well, I'm still not sure exactly what it is you're asking about that. Joy, tranquility, equanimity. Oh, the factors of... I didn't get the first two. The factors of enlightenment. Okay. Okay. Uh, First one is concentration. Second is mindful awareness. Then there's uh, joy, tranquility, and equanimity. Those are the five that constitute samatha. Okay. The sixth factor, which is also developed as a result of samatha practice, is energy. And the seventh factor is investigation. So samatha meditation becomes vipassana meditation when you add investigation to it. What's that? Do they have to go into all the factors? Well, they're factors that are present simultaneously uh, in a yogi who uh, achieves awakening. The order in which they're developed, the concentration and the mindful awareness are developed together. And when the concentration reaches a certain level, then the joy arises. And then, as the concentration uh, further improves, then the tranquility and the equanimity arise. So in terms of their, uh, uh, their order, it's uh, uh, concentration and mindfulness developing together, but it is their complete development which causes them to be uh, factors of enlightenment. Joy arises along the way, although you know the joy can be present at any time. But joy, meditative joy, the joy that arises in practice, corresponds to a certain degree of concentration. And likewise, the tranquility and equanimity develop really as a result of the combination of concentration, mindful awareness, and joy, and through uh, becoming sufficiently familiar with these, that the intensity of the joy subsides enough that allows tranquility and equanimity to emerge. So if we're thinking about a temporal sequence, that's, that's how we would think of it. Energy doesn't arise at any specific point in relation to the others, but develops throughout the process. And uh, and the points in the process at which it becomes most noticeable will vary with different yogis. But usually where it becomes uh, uh, most apparent in virtually all yogis is uh, in association with the rising of joy. Other questions? So energy here is the same as energy we are talking about in the usual way. Hmm? The energy in the enlightenment practice. It's the same as the energy we, we, said, we say in the usual times. Yes, well, the energy as a factor of enlightenment, it is the energy that serves to allow the mind to be uh, quite bright and alert fully aware. Uh, And in the process of development, it is as a 
uh, as an experience of energy moving in the body. But as a factor of enlightenment, it is the mature energy that characterizes the sort of diligence or the energeticness of the investigation that we conduct and the mindfulness that we sustain during that investigation. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. So uh, it would be it would be misleading to to say that the sensations of energy in the body that that aspect of energy is an enlightenment factor. But energy is a factor of enlightenment. But it is a factor of enlightenment in its application. So it must be present, but it's in its application that makes it a factor of enlightenment. Because otherwise, you know, it's just uh, it's just energy. Do you have the Sanskrit or Pali word for energy here? Uh, What's that? Miri. Is it something like it starts with V, Vir? Vir. Vir. It's Pali, not Sanskrit. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's the Pali. Yeah. I assume that Sanskrit is probably very close to Viriya. Viriya is Sanskrit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Sophia, you always have wonderful questions. You must have one. Yeah. I want to say to Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I put my my the mindfulness on my body. Mm-hmm. What I see and what I heard is not like a rock, but reduce the contact. You know what I mean? Okay. So what? And I want to, uh, but I try to mindfulness in breathing, but it's more, not so comfortable. Mm-hmm. My mind's body is better than in breathing. How do you think? Is, is mindfulness of the body is yeah. better than focus on the breathing? Than focusing on, on the breathing? That's what you're saying? That mindfulness in the body is better than mindfulness of breathing? Yeah. How do you think? Well, it depends on what you mean by, by better. Uh, Mindfulness of sensations in the body can sometimes be experienced as uh, easier to sustain than mindfulness of just the sensations of the breathing. But both are examples of mindfulness of the body, one limited and one in a larger area. The uh, mindfulness of the body this is one of the this is the first of the four applications of mindfulness. And the other three all have to do with mindfulness of uh, the uh, of the mind, of feelings and mental states and uh, mental objects. And so uh, mindfulness of the body can take many forms. In the description, of the first application of mindfulness called mindfulness of the body. The first part of that is a discussion of mindfulness of the breath. So actually the first and second parts of that are mindfulness of the breath. So mindfulness of the breath is a form of mindfulness of the body. And there are other, you know, you can be mindful of the breath in a small area, you can be mindful of the breath in the entire body because in this, in, in the part of the instructions on mindfulness of the body that are to do with the instructions of mindfulness of the breath, there uh, is both the instruction that placing his mindfulness before him, mindfully he breathes in and mindfully he breathes out, which is usually usually interpreted to mean mindfulness of the sensations of the breath either at the nostrils or at the abdomen or in some other similar place. 
But then a few lines later, the instruction is uh, mindful of the whole body he breathes in. Mindful of the, of the whole body he breathes out. Or actually what it goes is mi- mindful of the entire body he breathes in. Thus he trains himself. Mindful of the whole body he breathes out. Thus he trains himself. So even mindfulness of the breath can be mindfulness of the breath in one location or in the entire body. But then we go on and there are many other ways to practice mindfulness of the body, uh, including uh, mindfulness of the body in different postures and in the transition between those. So it's mindfulness of uh, sitting, lying, standing, and walking, and mindfulness of the transitions between each of those. And then there is mindfulness of the body that is uh, mindfulness uh, of going forward and going back, mindfulness of turning right and turning left, mindfulness of uh, lifting and putting down, mindfulness of uh, of uh, eating and chewing and swallowing, mindfulness of defecating and urinating, mindfulness of putting on the robes and taking off the robes. So you see, this is mindfulness of all of the different actions of the body. And that mindfulness involves not only what the actions of the body are, but what their purpose is and whether they are appropriate actions or not. Being aware of whether what you're doing is, uh, is something that you should or should not be doing. And so it also goes on other forms of mindfulness of the body, which I'm not so interested in dwelling on, but just to be a complete, to completely tell you what that phrase mindfulness of the body means. It also includes being mindful of the 32 parts of the body, like the sinews and the bones and the phlegm and so on and so forth. And the final form of mindfulness of the body is mindfulness of the uh, decay of the body, which is a a graveyard meditation in which you uh, are mindful of uh, the decomposition of a corpse. So these are all what are referred to by mindfulness of the body. So they're all meditations. But we take them all together, and what, what is this telling us? What is mindfulness of the body about? It is mindfulness of the uh, of everything that constitutes rupa, body, sensation of every kind. And it also includes within it mindfulness of action and purpose. Because in the, in the particular practice, which is uh, mindfulness of, of going forth and turning back and mindfulness of going left and going right and so on and so forth. This is mindfulness of action and mindfulness of purpose and also mindfulness of appropriateness of action. So mindfulness of the body is uh, a, a, a very large uh, and valuable, useful, very important aspect of mindfulness as a whole. So when you're practicing mindfulness of the sensations of the breath at the nose, you're practicing mindfulness of the body. When you are doing walking meditation in any of the forms that I describe, you're doing mindfulness of, of the practice of mindfulness of the body as well. See? And the phrase that you presented that mindfulness of the body is better than action, which I would say the action referred to is mindless action. And what it's pointing towards, what that phrase is pointing towards, is what we see in the world is mindless action. There's so much action, huge amount of action, 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 doing, 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 constantly, with minuscule mindfulness in it. And so, better no action and only mindfulness than all action and no mindfulness. Thank you. 
And in these practices, they are practices for cultivating the faculties of mind, including specifically those uh, factors of enlightenment. But they also are practice for living your life. You live your life one step at a time. Learn to live your life mindfully one step at a time. The steps, as with the meditation, may be long or short, and they may be fast or slow. But the point is that there is mindfulness, mindfulness of what's happening, and of course mindfulness of where the steps are intended to take you, and mindfulness of whether or not those steps are in fact taking you there. And of course, as you notice, that it is beyond our ordinary capacity to be mindful of everything in even a single step, in even a single moment. So it's important that we are selective of where we place our attention, how we use our conscious awareness. Uh, we're, uh, We're selective of that of which we are mindful. Now, of course, it is the case that as your mindfulness grows more powerful, that you can be mindful of more and more and more of a single step, like going from the first practice to the second practice. There can be greater awareness. And while doing the second practice of the nine parts, uh, you can, as you become skilled at it, you can walk more quickly and have the same awareness. And as your mindfulness grows more powerfully when you're doing a third practice, you, your mindfulness can encompass more at any one time. So mindfulness grows in power and effectiveness. But nevertheless, we see that there is so much and mindfulness, your, your conscious awareness is a, a limited capacity in, in any given circumstance. So it's very important that you are able to focus it on that which is most important. Right? And of course, we see that most people, the ordinary person in the courses of their lives, exerts no uh, uh, no control at all over what occupies their consciousness. And as a result, their conscious awareness is very often occupied by things that are more harmful than good. And they fail to be consciously aware of those things that uh, they should be, that it's most valuable and important to be. So just as in the walking meditation, we have to learn to direct our attention so that that which occupies our conscious awareness is that which is most valuable and useful to us. So your walking meditation is an instruction in how to live your life. Practice practice for what to do after you leave the retreat. Awakening is a progress, a a process. Life is a process. We are a process. And when you become serious about the Dharma, then the process that is life and the process that is awakening become one and the same. And the practice of mindfulness and uh, the investigation of uh, reality becomes what you do all the time, not something that you do periodically when you fit it in amongst uh, the rest of being mindless and being in action.
<laughs> and I think some of you already experienced that. At first, it's an exercise of uh, discipline and diligence to bring yourself out of the mindless lostness, not fully consciousness of ordinary life being swept here and there by the currents of desire and aversion. And it's a special effort that we make to pull ourselves out of it for short periods of time, long enough to do a daily practice or long enough to go on a retreat. But at some point, it becomes the meaning and purpose of our lives. And it's rather than something that we do from time to time, it's something that we wish to do, that we desire to do more than we desire to become lost in sensation and and lost in the things of the world. It becomes more and more a person's life. And mindfulness becomes habit for me. Practicing mindfulness hour after hour, day to day, day after day, in a retreat, sometimes seems tedious. Sometimes it's tiring. Sometimes you may have that feeling of, I just want to relax and stop doing this. I don't know if any of you have ever had that feeling. Have you ever had that feeling? That, yeah, I just, all this mindfulness. I just, yeah, I'm going to be mindless for a little while. But there comes a time when it's, it's the only way that you want to be. And then when you find that busyness causes your mindfulness to deteriorate, then you're very aware of it. And, and you, you really feel the lack of the clarity in your mind when, when busyness and things happening robs you of it. And when fatigue of the body robs you of it. Or when in illness you find that, uh, that uh, clarity of your mind is disturbed. And, uh, and then you find things like the, the precept against uh, dulling the mind with drugs and alcohol and things like that. It becomes sort of like, why would I want to do that to myself? Why would I want to sacrifice my precious awareness, my, my conscious awareness, uh, with these things? And so then this, this, the practice of mindful awareness and the process of awakening becomes the nature of uh, your life itself. It becomes a very happy, satisfying life. And it's not that you have an aha experience and ah, now I've got it all figured out and then you turn off the brain after that. You don't. You just, it keeps going deeper and deeper. The understanding, you know, the, the, the vision, the clarity, it just keeps getting better and better. You know? So. Yes? Maybe he's scratching. We'll come back and he can explain the scratching. <laughs> yes. It seems like uh, uh, just about everybody I observe, uh, especially the non cultivators, um, they get stuck. They don't change much. They get stuck in their habitual ways. Yeah. They have an extremely difficult time of breaking you know, their mold and improving themselves. And, uh, and but the thing is, you know, as, as our teacher, you, um, um, you seem to embody uh, a lot of the very, very desirable qualities, pretty much all of the best qualities of the three of my closest friends. And then, you know, and, and yet, you know, these three closest friends, they have a hard time breaking that out of their mold. And yet, uh, you somehow, you can kind of combine their best qualities and then kind of get rid of the, the, the bad qualities they have. <laughs> you know, it, 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 um, uh, did this came 
when, when you were a kid already, or you had to work really hard to develop it, and how did you manage to develop it? It's, it's a natural outcome of the process. A person who does the practice changes, and as insight arises, they change. They change insight. They don't decide to be different, force themselves to be different. What you do, the, the doing part of it, is just the simple practice, the exercise of the practice, and that brings the fruits. You don't, you know, there's, there's no, you can't make yourself change in this kind of way. And when changes take place in you, uh, it, it's not that you take credit, oh, look what I did. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's nothing to do with any you or self or doer in that sense. It's something that happens as a result of causes and conditions. You create the causes and conditions through such simple, simple actions, which is a good thing, because although we take, we imagine that we do all kinds of things, all that we're really capable of is very, very simple actions. So you take the appropriate simple actions and you do it consistently, and then changes take place in a person. Uh, like for example, how, 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 do you, how does a person overcome the laziness? Because I see that as my biggest, uh, biggest shortcoming. Laziness, well see, in, in the discussion of meditation, it's traditionally identified five hindrances. And uh, that in the practice of meditation you overcome these five hindrances and you've achieved samatha when you've overcome them. And each of these hindrances is opposed by and replaced by one of what are called jhana factors. And uh, then what we find in this relationship between hindrances and jhana factors is that through the cultivation of the jhana factors, the hindrances are overcome. And the resistance to uh, practice, laziness, is one of these hindrances. I'll tell you what the traditional five hindrances are. Uh, sloth and torpor is the name usually given to the one we're talking about right now. And then there is doubt, the second one. The third one is uh, sensual desire or desire for worldly things. The fourth one is uh, agitation, or the fourth one is ill will in, in the sequence that I'm giving it to you. And, and by ill will, we mean all of those kinds of negative thinking. The irritation and irritability and impatience which can lead into anger and hatred. They also include, ill will includes attitude, attitudes of criticism and judgment, including self-criticism and self-judgment. Okay, so that's, that's the fourth. And then the final hindrance in the list of the five that I'm giving you here is agitation of the mind due to worry and remorse. So you, you asked about how do we overcome uh, the hindrance uh, of laziness of procrastination, which in terms of meditation is described as a hindrance of sloth and torpor. So first of all, I'll point out to you what is inherent in this question. These five hindrances are in fact not just hindrances to meditation. They are the hindrances that operate in every aspect of our life. So when you overcome them in meditation, you've overcome them in every aspect of your life. But yes, the very, uh, this, this very problem of uh, laziness, reluctance, pr procrastination. A person, uh, just a, you, uh, a, a person becomes inspired in one way or another to pursue meditation and the practice of the Dharma. They hear something, they meet a person, they read a book, 
or a combination of all of these, and the inspiration arises in them. And then, yet to have yet yet to have any of the benefits of this practice, they form a determination that I would like to pursue that path. And the first thing that they encounter is that while the force of the inspiration is strong, for the first few days or, or whatever, no problem. You know, you can do this thing. But then one of the things is our lives are busy and how do you find the time? This takes so much time. And then there is the uh, judgment. Well, you know, I'm not getting any results. There must be something wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with the way I'm doing this. There's, I don't feel like it. I'm, I'm too tired. There's, uh, well, I'll do it after I do this other thing. It'll be better if I do this other thing first. Then it will be better. There's, you know, all these different ways that, that you end up not doing it. And even then, if you overcome the obstacles to sitting down and doing the practice, then you come up with the other manifestation of the hindrance of, well, uh, this, I, this is hard to do. I'm not enjoying this. I think, you know, well, I've still got 15 minutes to go on the clock. I'll just have a nice daydream and maybe I'll do better tomorrow. <laughs> Or, this is not going well. I'll quit for today, that's enough. I'll go and do something else and tomorrow I'll we'll be better. Or, get lost in the thought press of this process. There must be something wrong with me because uh, you know I'm trying to do this and it's just not working out. Or, this is probably not the right method. You know, I've heard of other teachers with different methods. I should probably just quit this and you spend a whole you can spend a whole meditation sit thinking about how you're going to go and see another teacher and learn that method and that one you'll be able to do every day. You know. I mean, does any of this sound familiar? Something. <laughs> 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 uh, resistance, procrastination. There's another factor in it too. You can say sloth and torpor. Two parts to torpor. Uh, one is the physical part and one is the mental part. Um, most people in our society don't get enough sleep. There's scientific studies that show this. Uh, they can, you know, and most people don't know that they don't get enough sleep and they don't realize that their abilities to function are impaired. But these, these are measurable. They've done studies and they take groups of people uh, and they have, they have them sleep different amounts of times and then they measure uh, you know, things that can be exactly quantified in terms of performance. And they show clearly that, that it requires a certain amount of rest. I mean, there's a vari- variation between individuals, but every individual requires a certain amount of rest in order to function at their best. And then Comparing that with what most people in our society do, I find that most people don't get the amount of rest that they need. So there's a physical aspect to torpor. And when you've been running, 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 and relying on external stimulation to keep you going in spite of whatever inner accumulation of fatigue that you have, then you sit down to meditate. Hmm. (laughs) You become overwhelmed by physical torpor. Um, if you're serious about meditation practice, you're going to have to take steps to overcome that. Now, the other thing is mental torpor. Uh, with all this busyness, you know, it becomes very appealing that when your mind really relaxes and your body relaxes, uh, even if you're not physically that tired, it's appealing to just indulge in, uh, you know, sinking into the nice, mellow, dozy mess. Okay, so what I've done is I've given you, these are all the different forms that resistance can take, sloth and torpor. How do you overcome it? The 
the solution to this problem is, well, first of all, you look towards why you want to do this anyway. Something inspired you. And what you're going to have to do, the first, the first stage in pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, is to maintain as high a level of inspiration as you can. So, uh, continuing to listen to Dharma talks, uh, go to presentations by teachers, uh, associate with people who are practicing, especially if there's somebody who is a uh, practitioner, a meditator, and you can see in them the benefits of the practice. That's very inspiring. So the people you associate with is very important. So do anything you can to maintain your inspiration. The specific ideas that you have acquired in the process of whatever brought you to that inspiration, bring them up frequently, refresh them in your mind so that you are really clear about why you want to do this. Then, the second thing is you've got to create the right circumstances, which means you're going to have to make changes in your life. You're, in order to have a successful practice, you're going to have to make adjustments. Uh, if the only way that most people can be successful in practicing regularly is to establish a particular time and place. Because as it is, how many hours to the med- in the day do you find yourself saying, hmm, nothing to do now, I wonder what I'll do. Hmm? Doesn't happen, does it? So if you're waiting for a gap like that when you're going to practice, it's simply not going to happen. You have to make the place. Which means, you know, and then you look at your, and as soon as you realize that you have to do that, I mean, a lot of people start out and say, this is great, I'm going to meditate for an hour every day. And then they don't, and they don't, and they don't. And it's like, well, I never have time. Well, you have to make the time. And then when you decide, and you say, well, I have to make the time, say, well, okay, I'm going to try to meditate at such and such a time every day. And the first thing you discover is the only way that will happen is something else has to give. So it has, there has to be a priority. You're going to have to not do something else. Because unless you're different than me, I have no way of stretching time. I can't add an extra, I can't shift to 25 hour days so that I have an hour of practice. And so, unless you can do that, something else has to go. And you have to make some choices. Then, that's fine, you've made some choices, you've figured out this is what I'm, this is what I'm going to practice. The next thing that you discover, though, is you keep coming to these things that, well, this is great usually, but today, just this one occasion, this other thing has come up. This is important. This is, this is unusual. This is a one-time thing. Okay, so I'll do this instead of meditating today. Or I'll do this now in my usual meditation time, and I'll find the time to meditate later. Right? Yeah, so that happens once, and a few days later it happens again, and then two days later it happens again, and then the day after it happens again. Next thing you know, there's all, what you discover is there is always something else. <laughs> so once again, it comes to priorities. You've got to come to that place. Yeah, and we do this. We do this in other things in our life. You know, we don't not go to work today because something else came up. We can't. We lose our job. <laughs> and meditation has to, you know, our determination to practice has to take on that same quality that, okay, this, this takes priority. You know, tell the ambulance to wait. I can't go to the hospital yet. Time for me to meditate. No, well, you know, maybe not that extreme. But you do really have to make it a, a, a priority because otherwise, just the natural course of things is going to keep eroding your opportunities to practice. But the answer, the answer always to overcoming sloth and torpor is to take action. 
And they're small actions. Choose a time. Uh, Recognize the conflicts. Think about it. Decide what you're going to change or what you're going to give up. You know, it's all simple actions. It's all very doable. You take it one step at a time. And then, of course, you sit down to meditate. You've got a regular practice, and your next problem is that the same resistance, the same procrastination, the same laziness, and the same sloth and torpor show up in your meditation period. And you have to do exactly the same thing. The answer is, just do it. Well, the other part of the answer, remember I said, is to bring your level of inspiration up as much as you can. And that's a very important part of it, too. And you can do that in your meditation practice. Exactly the same thing. Every day when you sit down, you can take the first few minutes, and you've got to be careful that this doesn't turn into a way of procrastinating and wasting time. But in your first few minutes, remind yourself, why do I want to do this? Refresh in your mind your motivation, your inspiration, your reasons. And what you'll find is that some days your motivation is stronger and some days it's lower. And that doesn't matter. What you do is whatever degree of motivation you have, you bring that into the forefront of your awareness. And some days your reasons are of the highest sort. And some days, your reasons are of the lowest and most mundane sort. Some days, your reason for practicing is because you want to become fully enlightened and you want to save all sentient beings. But other days, your only reason for practicing is that it would be embarrassing if your friends who are diligent practitioners knew that you were slacking off. And it doesn't matter. Whatever the reason is, you just say, okay, that's my reason. And you go with it. And, of course, if you can bring up stronger inspiration uh, uh, and, and, and more noble inspiration, well, of course, do so. But you go with what you've got. And that helps to prepare you. The second thing that you do is, uh, you know, you, okay, this is why I'm doing this. Be clear in your mind what you're doing. And how, you know, if you're going to meditate for half an hour, you're going to meditate for half an hour. If you're going to meditate for an hour, you're going to meditate for an hour. That has to be clear in your mind. And what practice are you going to do? You may have learned two or three different ways of practicing. You don't want to sit down and start practicing and five minutes into it say, eh, this is not what I feel like doing today. I think I'll switch and try that. And then do that for ten minutes. And no, this isn't it either. Uh, you know, what you've got to do is to decide what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. It's really helpful if, for whatever practice you're doing, that you have an understanding of where you are in the progress of it, what the challenges are that you may have to deal with, and uh, what it is that you hope to accomplish. So if you use these ten stages, you know, you say, well, yesterday my meditation was at this level, and this was a problem, and if that's the case again today, you know, I'm going to work on that, and hopefully I'll get past that and I'll get to the next level. So you have, you're clear in your mind before you actually start to practice what you're intending to do, what you are expecting that you probably would have to deal with, and and what you hope to achieve. It's good to have some kind of a goal. The third thing that you do, though, is you recognize that it might not turn out that way at all. Every time you meditate, it's different. And maybe you're at at this level yesterday and you're really looking forward to it. That's what I'm going to work on today. It may not be the case. So you also remind yourself that no matter what comes, you're going to accept that and you're going to work with that. And, and you make this, this commitment that you are going to be diligent and you're going to do the best that you can, whatever comes. But you are clear on what your intention is and your purpose. 
And you're also clear that you have no need to be attached to that. This will lead to you being able to practice very well. If you're not clear on what you're doing, as I say, you'll find yourself jumping around different ideas of, well, maybe I should try this, maybe I should try that. And you won't have a very productive practice. And if you have expectations, then you're going to experience disappointment, or sometimes you're going to experience excitement and you're going to pursue some kind of experience that uh, isn't really going to help you in your training. You're just going to be spending your time pursuing something. And then you, you make the commitment to you know just do the simple task, no matter what stage you're at, no matter what level your practice is at today. The task before you is very, very simple. And that's all, you just have to make the commitment to keep doing it, not to give up on it, not to decide to daydream or go to sleep or get up and go do something else. So this is where where the the preparation is is very effective. Um, You can, there's a few things you can do further than that, or one main thing that you can do further than that um, is to recognize these five hindrances. It's good to come to know them. And just examine your mind as you sit down ready to meditate and say, what's there? You know, Is there ill will in my mind because uh, uh, I, some things happened today and I just, you know, I have a state of irritation and irritability? And recognize that it's there. Recognize it there and prepare yourself in advance with the thought that I'm not uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to let this take hold of me. It may be there, but I'm going to practice uh, in a proper way. You may find that you have a lot of thoughts. There's something going on, some project you're excited about. You're going to make a lot of money if it works out. People are going to admire you, you know. And all you have to do is do these final things. So there's a great temptation to think about this project, right? If you know that, if you sit down and meditate and you know that that's there, you can say, okay, I know this is probably going to come up. And it's probably going to come up over and over again. You're prepared if you know that. So that when it comes up, it's, uh-huh, knew that would happen. I and mean, then just bring yourself back to the practice. Any of the kinds of things that you can think of, and everything, ultimately all of the all of the kinds of obstacles to your practice are encompassed in the five hindrances. So, you know, part of a preparation for practice can be just to do a quick check in your mind, okay, what are the ones that are most likely to come up today? You know, and you might catch them all, and that that doesn't matter. But you see what you've done in this few minutes is you've, you've made up your mind. You're really clear on what you're about to do. And so you've already helped to forestall a lot of the problems. And then the next thing is you just do it. And you just do it. Your mind wanders, you just do it. Some really tempting thought comes up, you let it go. And you just bring your mind back. You just do it. And so it's interesting that if you, in terms of this discussion here, if you want to know uh, of the uh, jhana factors, I said that each of these five hindrances is opposed by one of the factors that are known as jhana factors. Those five are directed attention, sustained attention, uh, joy, happiness, and single-pointedness. Which one of those opposes laziness, procrastination, sloth, torpor? It's directed attention. It's just doing it. Just doing it. Over and over again. Just doing it. Directing the attention. And what you find, of course you find you don't feel like meditating today and you're wrestling with the temptation to make some excuse. The solution what you'll find is if you remember, just do it. Okay, I'll just sit down. It's done. It's that easy. You can become locked in a struggle in your mind that seems hard to break. 
but taking action dissolves it. Well, here you are. You find yourself having a difficult meditation and thoughts are arising and doubts or maybe temptations to daydream or something else. You can sit there and struggle with yourself. One part of your mind says yes, and one part of your mind says no. And just you sit there and fight with yourself and get all uncomfortable. Or you can just let it go and bring your attention to the meditation object. The experience you'll have, I know you've already had this, is that if you do this, the problem disappears. As soon as you direct your attention to the meditation object, that conflict evaporates. It may come back again in two or three minutes, but that is the solution to it. Directed attention overcomes this particular problem more effectively than anything else. And you're speaking from experience. You know, you you didn't born with all these uh, qualities already. You uh, you overcame <laughs> the problems one by one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I'm telling you from experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're younger, you're pop, you're you're just as obnoxious and bad as uh, the rest of us. Oh, <laughs> way worse. <laughs> way worse. <laughs> <laughs> he said that to yeah, out of kindness and, and yeah. uh, if I had me show up at a meditation retreat I'd probably make me leave <laughs> <laughs> no, <I wouldn't>, but. <laughs> <laughs> he said that out of compassion how to make us feel good <laughs> <laughs> yes so what are the other character the other what the other the other uh, Counters. Uh, yeah, to counter the hindrances. To counter the other hindrances? Okay. Well, uh, in the order that I gave them to you, of the hindrances, the second one was doubt. Yeah. Now, the reason that I put doubt second in order is because that's the order in which it usually becomes a major problem. You start experiencing doubt. It reemerges over and over again throughout the process. But Usually, just when you start to get a handle on uh, establishing a practice and dealing with uh, resistance and procrastination, then the next big one you have to deal with is doubt. The jhana factor that counteracts doubt is sustained attention, which we could translate to you keep doing the practice. Because if you keep doing it, you get results, and results remove doubt. So. In the beginning, when it seems that you can never keep your mind on the meditation object for more than a few minutes at a time, if you just continue, you'll discover that you can, and you'll feel really pleased and rewarded and satisfied. Huh? Success overcomes doubt. And the same thing all the way along. When you reach the seventh stage, and in the seventh stage very often, here I am, I've got this great single point of concentration, and... But, you know, it it takes constant effort and vigilance to maintain it, and nothing is happening. Here I am with this great concentration. Where's the joy? Where's the happiness? Where's all all this other good stuff? Where's the lights? Where's the energy? Nothing here. Ah, you know, and then at that point, doubt comes. You know, maybe there's something wrong with me. Uh, (laughs) uh, Maybe that's just a made-up story. It doesn't really happen anyway. It's just how how they get people to come and do this practice by telling them they're going. I mean, doubt can, all, all kinds of things come up. But the thing is, if you just continue to do the practice, it will come. The joy and the happiness and all the other things, they come. So, the similar to directed attention overcoming uh, the problem of resistance, sustained attention overcomes the problem of doubt because eventually uh, you do realize the rewards. And the way that it usually happens is you'll get a taste of it. You know, you'll be, you'll have a lot of doubt uh, and then all of a sudden you'll have, uh, something will happen in your meditation that you re- it's, you know, it's like, wow, I can't believe, I, wow, for, Fifteen minutes there, I just, my concentration on mind was so still and I felt so calm and peaceful and happy and joyful. And you might not be able to do that again for a month, you know. But the fact that it happened 
that went a long way towards overcoming the doubt. Now you, you know what's happened. You know what's possible. You know what get. So, sustained attention overcomes doubt. Now, in uh, third in order of these uh, hindrances as I offer them to you, is worldly desire. Because and as, you know, when you get excited, I'm going to learn to meditate, and the first two or three times you sit down, that is really great. I just love this. I'm going to keep on doing this. And by the time you're doing it for a week, you know, you say, "Well, my concentration is worse than ever. My mind is all over the place. I'm thinking of everything. I'm thinking of the most silly, ordinary things like, yeah, my car needs an oil change. I have all these mundane thoughts just coming and coming and coming." Because the novelty is worn off, and this is this is worldly desire. This is concern with things of the world. This is what your mind's thinking about all the time, anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Well, as soon as the novelty wears off, yeah, your mind's going to go back to thinking of the same kind of things there's always things about. You know, you have to take the trash out because tomorrow's the trash pickup day, and you know, where did I leave my keys? And I forgot to phone so and so. And uh, I wonder if uh, the girl on the next floor wants to go on a date. And, you know, I mean, all of these kind of thoughts. And the, the, uh, the, more, the more boring sitting here looking at your breath is, then the more thoughts associated with desire arise. And it's one of the things that you have to deal with. And so the experience you have is thoughts arise, they capture the attention, uh, and then the mind wanders and you have to bring them back. Or later on, you, you don't ever lose a meditation object, but the thoughts just, these, these thoughts just keep coming. The antidote, the jhana factor that counteracts it, is uh, what is, uh, is a single pointedness. But to say it's the uh, maintaining the attention on the meditation object and ignoring the thoughts. If you ignore the thoughts, the way that they're enca- they're countered is that eventually they become less frequent and they start to go away. They become less and less frequent. Now, in the, there's a progression, normal progression, in the kinds of thoughts that manifest. The first kind of thoughts are mostly mundane thoughts. And as your mind stops bringing up so much really mundane, ordinary thoughts, then it starts bringing up thoughts that seem to have a, a deeper import. Uh, insights uh, into uh, things about yourself or your relationship, or your family, or your career, or the Dharma. So the thoughts, actually what happens is there ceases to be so many not that interesting, annoying, ordinary thoughts. And they begin to be replaced by not so many, much more interesting, much more important seeming thoughts. And so you deal with this temptation to go with them. Uh, but they too will pass away if you just ignore them. And that's, that's how single-pointedness, just stay with the meditation object, let the thought come and go. After a while, uh, uh, they become less and less frequent. The next hindrance is ill will. Now, ill will can produce distracting thoughts that you have to deal with, as we said before, by ignoring them. Uh, you know, if you've had an argument with somebody or you're irritated about something or you have a problem with something, you may have a mundane kind of thought that is based in ill will. You may remember a disagreement. You may find yourself continuously uh, rerunning an argument in your mind or something like that. 
And you deal with that the same way you do with uh, any other kind of thought, just by ignoring it. But as you go along, you'll find if if you have any more deep-seated sources of ill will in your mind stream, in your consciousness, this will start to come up. You know, uh, terrible things that have happened to you in the past and you still have resentment or hatred about them. You haven't thought about that in years, but all of a sudden there it is in your meditation. Ill will manifests uh, through the arising of those kinds of thoughts. Sometimes you won't even recognize the source of it. But to the degree that you have ill will in your mind stream, there will be certain kinds of images and emotions that arise during meditation. And you need to become purified of those. So what you do is when they come up, you recognize them for what they are. And you admit that they have a right to be there and then you liberate them and just let them go away by themselves. The jhana factor that overcomes these is uh, that of pleasure. And as your concentration improves, you won't really have the experience of a lot of pleasure, you know, the comfort in your body and the pleasantness, until you've managed to pretty much let go of whatever ill will that you have. It doesn't mean that, well, you know, you say, oh, I experience pleasure in my meditation. It means that my mind stream is completely purified of all will. What it does mean is that in the time that you experience that, that ill will is not creating a hindrance to the arising of physical pliancy and and the pleasure, pleasure of meditation. And the vice versa, as as you come to the place in the unification of mind where physical pliancy arises and the uh, bodily pleasure arises, then that is going to put a stop to the uh, arising of ill will in the in the stream of consciousness. Yes. So when you say pleasure, I mean it's pity. Pity. No, that's a pity is the next one. It's the meditative joy that counteracts uh, the hindrance of agitation due to worry and remorse. So, so in the development of pity, before that, you develop the mental pliancy that allows you to remain single-pointedly on the mental on, on the meditation object. <clears throat> then comes physical pliancy. The body no longer has aches and pains, but uh, it actually feels quite pleasant. And it feels so pleasant that the bell rings and you don't want to move because this feels really nice. Th- this, is, this is the pleasure. That, that's the uh, jhana factor of sukha, which refers both to bodily pleasure and to mental happiness. And in the progress of arising mental pliancy, physical pliancy, bliss of physical pliancy, then comes the bliss of mental pliancy, and then comes the subsiding of the intensity of the bliss of mental and physical pliancy. That's the way it develops. So what we're talking about here is that once you have a a sufficient degree of mental pliancy, physical pliancy develops with its concomitant physical pleasure. And that will help to suppress uh, the Ill will, Ill, the hindrance of ill will. But also, the presence of the hindrance of ill will will keep that from arising. Yeah? Oh, sorry, please continue. Okay, sorry. so I'll, I'll go through. We're already getting yes. well into lunchtime. Oh, yes. Okay. The last two hindrances and the John factors associated with them. The next hindrance is agitation of the mind due to worry and remorse. Well, you can have agitation of the mind due to worry and remorse at any stage. And right at the beginning you can have agitation of the mind uh, due to worry about really silly things like 
Uh, did I lock my keys in the car? What am I going to do after I finish meditating if my keys are locked in the car? Or remorse about you know something you said to somebody. But later on in the practice, in the sequence of developing uh, mental pliancy followed by physical pliancy followed by bliss of physical pliancy, the next thing that comes up is the bliss of mental pliancy, meditative joy, the energy and the joy. Now, if your mind is agitated at, at the deeper levels, at levels you're not necessarily conscious of, by feelings of worry that, uh, you know, because of what might happen in the future, usually arising out of things that you did, you know. Uh, something you haven't declared on your income tax for the last four years and you got this letter saying you're going to audit, there's going to be worry, right? <laughs> uh, all kinds of things. But we may have all kinds of things that are creating worry that we're not even aware of. Things that we've done, potential consequences that we're afraid of. Uh, because we really wanted to live in a big house. We bought one that we could afford, but it's in a neighborhood with a lot of crime. There's going to be seeds of worry just percolating away in, the, in, in your mind. And you may not have been aware of them, you've been living here for six months, but you sit down to meditate and you get to the point where this bliss of, of mental pliancy should be arising, but instead the mind has too much agitation because you've not yet come to the resolution of this state of worry that you've created. You know, or there's, a, there's this uh, recession taking place and people are getting laid off and, you know, you think your job's secure, but maybe it isn't. That may still be there. That, that will get in your way. And maybe that your mind needs to be purified of this. It may think need to be that these things need to come to the surface of your awareness so that you have the opportunity to look at them and accept them and realize that you can't do anything about them and just let go of them. That will let the, the, uh, the bliss of, of mental pliancy, that will let the joy and happiness arise. The other thing is remorse. We've done things that we regret. We may have done things a long time ago that we've suppressed in it, but we still have the, the regret and the remorse because of them. Those will get in the way too. Uh, so you can have agitation of the mind due to worry and remorse at all levels, and it may show up at any stage of meditation, but it becomes a particularly important obstacle at that point where PT should be arising. If PT doesn't arise, it may be that you have some things there that you're not aware of that are going to need to purify themselves before it comes. But then once the PT arises, it will it will put a damper on the rest of that stuff. You may not have completely purified your mind stream, but for the time being, it will be controlled by that by that piti, by that meditative joy. Um, why did I leave out? You said why did I leave out anything? That's fine. Yes, That's <laughs> good. We're only ten minutes late for lunch. <laughs> okay. Well, I was wanting to tell you about the five hindrances and the part they play in your practice. There's much more that we could say, and so uh, over the next few days, uh, any of those things that occur to you, you can ask me about it, and we can go more deeply into it. Thank you.